Chapter 7 of The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts It was foggy and rainy and cold the morning of February 9th, 1818, when Jean Marie left Eccoli to go to his new parish at Ars. He had hired a man to carry his scanty clothing, his books, and Father Bailey's bedstead, which, with a few blankets, was his inheritance from his beloved old pastor. Unaccustomed to riding, Father Vianney walked on ahead of the cart. Men left their work, women ran to the doors of their houses to wave goodbye to their beloved priest. The children, his particular charge, cried as they kissed his hand and asked for his blessing, and tiny tots, unstrung by the sadness they did not understand, added their wails to the general lamentation. The priest, however, was intent on the parish to which he was going. The picture of it with the vicar general had given him showed a place in sad need of reorganization. He framed a greeting to have ready for the first of the parishioners who should come out to welcome him. On that early contact, a great deal would depend. As he moved into the valley where ours lay, the air seemed to become heavy and depressing. A great chateau stood on a hill to the north of the village. In it, Father Vianney had been told he would find a friend, one of the good women whose family had clung to the faith when others were letting it go. When he crossed the boundary line of his new parish, he knelt on the ground to ask divine help and guidance in his work there. Darkness came down as the short, thin, almost emancipated priest trudged onward. Once in a while, now, he would see yellow lamplight shining out of the windows of houses hidden among the trees. But no one seemed aware that their new pastor was coming, or if they did know, they did not care. No one came out with a greeting, no word of welcome was spoken. When he reached the village of Ars, he went directly to the little church which was to be his care. The steeple was gone, destroyed by the revolutionaries in 1793, though the bell had been saved, and now hung on a crazy structure of beams across the rafters of the building. His heart was unhappy at the all-too-evident neglect in the church itself, a church in which no sanctuary lamp burned because the Blessed Sacrament was not there. The carter unloaded his wagon, said a sad goodbye to his beloved Father Vianney, and started home. The priest cleaned the church as well as he could, straightened out his own mud-walled cottage, and went to bed for his first night in Ars. Before daybreak the next morning, the new curry of Ars rang the Angelus, wondering as he did so if bell, rafters, and even part of the roof would come crashing down. A small handful of older women, no men and no young people, hurried in for mass. Knowing that almost all of his parishioners were farmers, Father Vianney decided after Mass that he would walk around each morning and meet them at their work or call on the families at meal times, when all would be at home. Having been a farmer himself, he knew how their day went and knew, too, what to talk about with them. His face in repose was certainly not handsome, but his smile, illumined as it was by goodness and love, usually won over the people whom he greeted. When he called at their homes, he was always able to make friends with the children, whom he then urged to come to catechism classes. The oldest and the youngest among his flock were no particular problem. If they had forgotten their way to church, or had never learned it, he felt that it would soon become familiar to them. The young adults were a different matter. A man that for pleasure had swept France in the past years. Work was hard. Tiny incomes were heavily taxed. God had been ridiculed as an ancient superstition. The result was that a whole generation had grown up with no knowledge of any commandment except the one which said, Have a good time wherever and however you can. Sundays and holy days were ideal to these people for a round of worldly pleasure. Those who did not care for roistering simply carried on with their daily work. On Saturday evening a band concert gave the signal for the revels to begin. Sunday morning resounded to more band music followed by public games and dancing, which continued well into the next morning. There was one church in ours largely ignored, but there were four taverns which, particularly on Sundays and holy days, were full to bursting. In the pleasure man section of a pleasure-bent country, ours stood out as the center of wild carousals, and people drove in from many miles around to take part in the unrestrained celebration. Father Vianney was sick at heart. In his pulpit he used plain, strong language about these things, but the people who heard him were not the ones he wanted to reach, were not the ones who skipped mass, to go to licentious dances, or to get drunk in taverns. Though his congregation did carry the message home, it made little impression. 
One Sunday he got up very early, long before Mass, and walked down the road to meet the musicians coming to play for the dance. How much do you get for playing? he asked. They told him. It was a good deal of money, considered in terms of his own hundred dollar a year income, but he did not hesitate. Here, I'll give you twice that sum, he said. Now go home and forget the dance. There was great resentment when the would-be dancers learned what had happened, but a few people, having no other way to fill their time, drifted into the church to see what was going on there. The sermon, as usual, was what people needed to hear, and some of them heeded. The priest had driven in the first wedge in his campaign to separate the people from their evil way of life. His sermons, in which he assured the farmers that in making a practice of carting their hay on Sunday, they were carting their souls to hell, had some effect. But the priest was anxious for a quicker reaction. So, once again, he decided on the direct method. Each Sunday before Vespers, he took to walking down the lanes which farmers might use on their way home from work. Although the men strongly opposed the new ideas he was trying to introduce, they now had great respect for Father Vianney, the man, and would rather not be caught by Father Vianney, the priest. One Sunday, when the curie was going down the road, he saw coming toward him a wagon piled high with sheaves of grain. The weather had been good, and showed no signs of changing, so there was no excuse for the full day of Sunday work that the lay represented. The driver of the wagon was not visible, but the priest recognized the horses as belonging to a wealthy farmer of the district. He seized their reins and brought them to a halt, then called the farmer by name. Come out of there, he cried. From whom are you hiding? The grain sheaves shifted, and from under the heap there crawled the red-faced, sheepish farmer. Why did you cover yourself with the grain that way? Father Vianney's large eyes flashed fire. I, I didn't want you to see me, the embarrassed man stuttered. And did you think you were hiding from God, too? Did you think he couldn't see you under the grain? Does he not see everything you do? The direct, powerful personality of the priest reached the conscience of the farmer. He, at least, would do no more unnecessary Sunday work. Life in the little French towns had, for centuries, been regulated by the bells of the village churches. The day's work started, paused at noon, and came to its close to the sound of the Angelus. The year after Father Vianney reached ours, he decided that the crazy structure which supported his bell should be replaced by a proper belfry. From his own pitifully small store of coins, he himself started the subscription list. The Viscount of ours, who lived in Paris, was visiting his mother in the chateau outside the village when the first moves towards restoring the church were made. He was so impressed by what had already been accomplished by the new curie that he joined his mother in generous donations of money and material. The church roof was repaired, little shrines were erected, and God's wardrobe, as the curie called the vestments, was refurbished and enlarged. The curie's own home was a peasant house built of clayey mud. Of the two rooms on the ground floor, kitchen and dining room, the stone-floored kitchen was used most. Father Vianney's own meals were frugal, almost non-existent, just as they had always been, but he kept food on hand to give the hungry passers-by the homeless and neglected children. And while he fed their bodies, he instructed their minds in the hope of awakening their souls. Of the three bedrooms on the second floor, the one nearest the church was his, although the few hours of sleep he permitted himself were more often than not taken on the bare floor with a piece of wood for his pillow. Most of his time was spent in working and praying, and, after Christ and his mother, the one to whom he prayed with the greatest faith was St. Philomena. Not long before Father Bailey's death, there had been visiting in Eccoli a young woman named Pauline Jericot, who later, we shall see, launched a great mission work. She, for good reason, had deep devotion to this young martyr. Miss Jericot had told the two priests the story, not well known at the time, of the girl Philomena, who had died for her faith in the reign of the Emperor Diocletian. Miss Jericot had been gravely ill some time before, so ill that doctors had given up all hope of her recovery. She had been carried, almost unconscious, to the shrine where St. Philomena's relics were kept, and there had been miraculously cured. Quite naturally, she was eager to tell as many people as possible of the young saint's power in heaven. At once, Father Vianney had been greatly attracted to the dear little saint, as he called her, and he turned to her in all his perplexities. To Philomena he would say, when he instructed the children, nothing is refused. 
She loved God so much that when she was just a little girl she died for him. So of course he listens when she asks. He credited to her all the success he had in ours. However, he never simply turned a problem over to her. He worked hard and asked for her help in the work, and the work continued successful. His one feat in stopping a Sunday dance did not, of course, end those pagan revels, but things began to be a little different. Several times when the crowd gathered, he walked over and stood quietly looking at the people, drinking and rioting, when they should have been in church. The deep, earnest eyes, burning in the sorrowful, aesthetic face, spoke the words his tongue did not. Many of the revelers went home, and the spirits of those who remained were dampened. This angered the tavern keepers. We have built up a good business here, they growled. What does he want to do, ruin us? Father Vianney did not want to ruin anyone or anything except sin. He would have liked to see the disappearance of the places which contributed so much to the drunkenness and debauchery of ours. And, bit by bit, he moved toward his goal. When he rebuilt and refurbished his little church, he had installed a new confessional. There he began to spend more and more of his time. His fame as a confessor and advisor was spreading. In his early days in ours, there were but two people in the village itself on whom he could count for help in the church. One was Mrs. Bidboss, the housekeeper, who lived near the rectory, and the other a Miss Pignot, who boarded with her. These two women cleaned the church, dressed the altar, and tried between themselves to supply periods of daily adoration. This, of course, pleased the curie, but he wanted more. He wanted church societies. One day a group of the giddiest girls in town had gathered in the village square, ready to start off on a round of drinking and dancing. Father Vianney saw them. Here, he said to himself, is my rosary confraternity ready-made. I'll go out and talk to them. He advanced to the green and greeted the girls pleasantly, pretending not to know what their plans were or where they were bound. Come, he suggested, let's go into church and say the rosary. We'll pray that whatever it is you're going to do, you will do well. The girls were upset and confused. To go into the church and pray was the thing furthest from their minds. Yet they did not know how to refuse this gentleman with the penetrating eyes. Each waited for someone else to laugh at the suggestion, to walk away. If one did, they all would, but no one had the courage. Against their will and wishes, compelled by a stronger personality than their own, they went rather sulkily into the church, knelt and prayed. There was silence when they finished. Then one of the girls spoke. "'I'd like to go to confession, Father,' she said timidly. "'I would, too,' said another. And so he got the nucleus of the little band who would help in his war against evil. Through these girls, among others, it became known that Father Vianney told penitents what they needed to hear. He scolded some, comforted and encouraged others. Often when crowds were waiting outside his confessional, he would step out and select one far down in the line to come first for he knew unfailingly when the effort to come had been hard, when the long wait might give Satan a chance to persuade the penitent to leave. And, strangely enough, no one ever protested when a latecomer was given precedence over those who had waited for hours. They were convinced that Father Vianney's decisions were inspired. When Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, impelled largely by the work of Pauline Jericot, authorized the cult of St. Philomena, the curie of ours at once built a little shrine in her honor at the side of the church. He was delighted when it became a center of pilgrimage. What he did not know, would not have believed, was that many of the people traveled to ours only incidentally to visit the shrine. Their primary reason was to see, to talk with, to go to confession to Father Vianney. Now the town itself had changed, so much so that the four taverns functioned no longer as such. They were now small hotels for the convenience of the many pilgrims. The old ours was no more. When Father Vianney had been curie for five years, the bishop, amazed at all that had been accomplished, sent for him. The town of Salos was larger than ours, the prelate said, but as much in need of conversion as ours had been. Father Vianney, therefore, was to take it for his new parish, his new battlefield. The people of ours were heartbroken and indignant. Father Vianney was theirs. Through him they had given up their old evil ways. Through him they had made their peace with God and received spiritual and material blessings. Although they knew their priest himself would do as he was told, they were less anxious to cooperate. I'd like to strangle that vicar general, one young woman declared. He must have told the bishop about the curie. It's all his fault that we are losing our saint. 
Hush, said her mother. That's a dreadful thing to say. It is the will of God that our good curie should leave us. I don't believe it's God's will, insisted the girl, and it almost seemed as if she were right. The priest packed his few possessions and loaded them on a cart, ready to leave after mass the following morning. But heavy torrents of rain fell that night, and the next day, when the cart reached the little river over which they had to pass on the way out of ours, it was so flooded that crossing was impossible. So Father Vianney went back to the town to wait for the flood to subside. The parishioners, having ascertained that the curie did not really want to leave them, but was acting rather from obedience, started collecting signatures on a petition to the bishop, asking that Father Vianney be left with them. The mother of the Viscount of Ars, the great lady of the chateau herself, headed the movement, and before they could present their request, Father Vianney packed up again to try to follow the bishop's orders. Again there was distress in the village, unhappiness that they had not moved faster in their efforts to keep their priest, dismay that all hope seemed gone. But again rain came, the river flooded, there was no crossing. This time there was no relaxation in ours. They had had their hopes raised, dashed, and raised again. They felt unsure and insecure as they waited for word from the vicar general in reply to their petition. But where, in the past, disappointment and worry would have meant cursing and drunkenness among many of the villagers, now they turned to prayer, to daily mass, and to more frequent communion. The flooded river subsided again, and across it came a messenger from the bishop. Father Vianney was to stay with his people. Now, more than ever, the pastor was the beloved shepherd of his flock. Almost every home had a warm welcome for him. He was in touch with every facet of their lives. Their work, their health, their herds, their crops, all were of interest and importance to him. In time of joy, in sorrow or fear, the people turned to Father Vianney. The children, always his greatest care, knew that they had an unfailing friend in him. He planned a school for girls, where the future mothers of families could learn to read and write and figure, but, most important, learn of the love of God. Pilgrims came in great and greater numbers, and one dreadful visitor came. End of chapter 7 Recording by Maria Therese